All right. <clears throat> well, welcome back for yet another ride down chemistry lane with your fabulous chemistry teacher, or maybe not so fabulous, uh, Mr. Hudeberg here, okay? Um, so we're mixing things up, and we're going to dig down into the nucleus of the atom with this unit, all right? Uh, so some things to have in front of you, this handy periodic table, uh, of course your notebook or notebook paper and calculator. Uh, these are going to be some necessary items to be successful uh, with the following along process, all right? Um, so we are doing an intro to nuclear chemistry, right? And nuclear chemistry, as the name implies, focuses on the nucleus and the particles in the nucleus, which would be protons and neutrons. All right. Um, so first of all, we should at this point have a familiarity with the term isotope. Isotopes are the same type of atom, right? So if I'm talking about oxygen isotopes, I'm talking about oxygen atoms, right? But they have a slightly different mass due to their uh, various numbers of neutrons, right? Um, so quick reminder, all isotopes of the same type of element have the same number of protons. They just vary in their number of neutrons. Right, now, um, a radioisotope, okay, is going to be a new term we introduce here. So what you have to understand is some configurations of the nucleus for various elements are not stable, all right? Uh, and really this comes down to a proton to neutron ratio, okay? Um, so you guys, with the, the graph you, you generated in, in class, uh, you first plotted stable isotopes, which have a proton to neutron ratio that works for those elements, right? Uh, you drew kind of a smooth curve through those. So you had this, doo -doo, and you had your smooth curve. Then you plotted some elements that didn't quite fit on that curve, right? And those would be isotopes for those elements that are not stable. They don't have the right ratio of protons and neutrons for the forces that hold those particles together to do their job correctly, all right? So when we have an unstable proton to neutron ratio, right, it's referred to as a radioisotope, and uh, we say that those are radioactive, okay? Radioisotopes are isotopes with an unstable nucleus. Again, because something about the proton to neutron ratio doesn't allow the binding forces in that nucleus to kind of hold the particles together correctly or appropriately, all right? So what happens when an element or an isotope is unstable is it undergoes a process called radioactive decay until it reaches a stable configuration of proton to neutron, okay? So if it's a radioisotope, that means it's unstable. If it's unstable, it will go through some sort of change within its nucleus, right? And that change to the nucleus usually amounts to some sort of particle emission or energy emission uh, to cause that change um, until it becomes stable, at which point it would no longer be considered a radioisotope. All right? So when we have, say, something is going undergoing radioactive decay, we're saying the nucleus undergoes changes over time, okay? And one of the following things is going to happen, right? We're either going to increase the number of protons, all right? And that's done so through a process called electron emission. We will increase the number of neutrons through a process called electron capture or positron emission, which are actually two different processes that cause the same thing. Or uh, we'll decrease the size of the nucleus and undergo a process called alpha decay. All right, And we'll talk about what happens actually within each of those here in just a moment. But those are the three processes uh, we are going to talk about. And it is worth pointing out that in all those processes, we undergo some gamma radiation, which is just uh, the nasty type, actually, uh, which is just kind of pure energy that leaves that nucleus. Uh, that's the nasty stuff that we worry about causing uh, cellular damage, usually. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is what we call beta decay. In the case of beta decay, uh, we are emitting an electron, okay? And so, by the way, the symbol for an electron is a 0, minus 1, E, right? So when you see the 0 minus 1 E, we know that that is a symbol for an electron. When we do these uh, 
uh, nuclear decay equations. Okay, so that's something you need to recognize and remember. There's actually several symbols that we'll we'll get through here in just a minute. Okay, um, so one of the things I want you to start thinking of is a neutron itself is essentially a proton and an electron that have been fused together. Right. So if I take a plus and a minus and I fuse them into a single particle, I get a neutral particle. Right. There's no longer a charge associated with that. Now. We said last chapter that protons and neutrons have essentially the same mass, but neutrons don't have a charge. Now, the reason the mass doesn't change, if you'll recall, is that electrons have too small of a mass to really make any difference. So if I fuse a proton and an electron together, right, I'm not really changing the mass of that proton because the electron is so small. But what I am doing is I am neutralizing the charge of that proton. So I make a neutral particle with approximately the same mass or essentially the same mass as a proton. And that's that particle we call a neutron. All right. So uh, when we think of that, right, we what we have to understand is if we have a radioisotope that is radioactive because the nucleus is unstable, sometimes it's unstable because we don't have enough neutrons or protons, excuse me. So we're deficient in protons. Or you might describe that as being neutron rich or too many neutrons. Okay, so with beta decay, which is usually done through uh, electron emission, okay, we're essentially transforming a single neutron into a single proton. So if I take the neutron and I get rid of that negative charge, right, and it essentially goes off. Right. What I'm left with is the positive part of that neutron, which is essentially a proton. OK. So what's the result of beta emission or electron emission? Right. I increase the number of protons. OK. It, there is a decrease in the number of neutrons. But because I'm shedding an electron and electrons don't really have any mass, there is no change in mass. All right. So if I was to write the decay equation for helium six, so helium six is a an isotope of helium. That's a radioisotope. Right. So the way I'd write this transformation or transmutation from helium six to lithium six would be like this. So the mass number for helium is six. The atomic number for helium is two. And we get that from our periodic table, which is why we want to have that out. So this is going to be my symbol. OK, now. What's going to happen to produce this lithium-6? So I'm essentially transmutating the helium into a lithium atom. All right. And to do so, remember, I'm going to increase my number of protons. Okay. So lithium, if you find it on your periodic table, table its atomic number is three. Right. So I'm going to have three protons. Okay. But because I'm shedding an electron, the mass stays the same. Okay, so now I'm no longer helium, I am lithium, right? Now, with conservation of matter, conservation, etc., we have to account what caused the change from two to three, right? So, I, what I did was I took one of my neutrons and transmutated it into a proton, and in doing so, I shed one electron. So, this is where that symbol for electron is going to become in handy. Zero minus one e so what this decay equation is telling me is this radioisotope of helium right here okay became a lithium isotope that is stable and it did so by getting rid of one electron from the nucleus okay so that electron emission was a proton or excuse me a neutron right that it contributed to that mass of six shed its negative part so that it was no longer neutral. So it became positive, which would be a proton. So I see a corresponding increase in the number of protons, which is indicated by that three. If I change the number of protons, as you guys remember from last chapter, I also change the, the element itself. So from helium to lithium. And to do that, though, I had to emit an electron, which is indicated by that symbol for an electron. So that is a decay equation for um, a neutron-rich atom, right? 
we set an electron to turn one neutron into a proton, so our atomic number goes up, mass stays the same. All right, moving on to the next type. So if I have um, too many neutrons, or sorry, too many protons, not enough neutrons, right? So that would be what we call proton rich or neutron deficient, okay? I undergo essentially the opposite of um, electron emission. That's positron emission or electron capture. And sometimes it is indicated like this. So we saw back on the last slide, beta decay is with a, a beta minus. Sometimes you'll see positron emission or electron capture indicated with the beta positive. All right. So essentially, we are uh, getting rid of a positive charge using one of two methods. It's either we're going to emit a positron or capture an electron. Um, more common would be an electron capture mechanism. Okay. So what happens in this case? Um, we're going to turn a proton into a neutron in this case. So again, we won't see a change in mass, right? So we have no net change in mass because a proton and a neutron have essentially the same mass, right? So we're going to see the opposite, though, happen with our atomic number and number of neutrons. So with beta decay, with electron emission, right, we saw a decrease in, or an increase in the number of protons. With positron emission or electron capture, we see a decrease in the number of protons and an increase in the number of neutrons. Okay, so some, some examples of what would happen here is if we have magnesium-23. Magnesium-23 uh, isn't, it's not a stable form of magnesium. We actually need more neutrons in magnesium to make that a stable form of magnesium. Okay, so because it's unstable, it will undergo some sort of change to its nucleus to get that proton to neutron ratio uh, to a stable form. All right, so in the case of magnesium-23, it forms sodium-23. All right, so let's write that decay equation. So magnesium-23, its symbol is going to be Mg23 over 12, all right? Because all magnesium has an uh, atomic number of 12, okay? So if I'm going to undergo a positron emission, all right, that means I'm ejecting a positron. Now, a positron is not the same as a proton, by the way. A positron is essentially the part of the proton that makes it positive, okay? Uh, and it's about the same mass as an electron, interestingly, so we won't see a change in our mass with that ejection. So if I was going to go positron emission, it would look like this. So Mg2312. Now, I'm going to decrease my number of protons to 11, all right, to form sodium. But my mass is going to stay the same because I'm not... I'm changing a proton into a neutron, all right? Now, positron symbol, by the way, is 0, 1, E. So it's different or differentiated from an electron. And an electron, of course, has a negative symbol attached to that 1 on the bottom, whereas a positron does not, okay? So to form this through positron emission, I'm going to eject a positive particle or a positron. Now, I could also accomplish the same thing through electron capture, okay? So, um, now, for you guys, there's no, no reason to distinguish between positron emission and electron capture other than the way it's written in a decay equation. Uh, I will never ask you to actually predict which is which, okay? Uh, we have to know that either one of these essentially accomplish the same thing. They're just different methods for doing so. All right, so let's take this decay equation for krypton-81 to bromine-81. So Kr, mass of 81, and because it's krypton, its atomic number is 36. All right, now, to accomplish a decrease in the number of protons or an increase in the number of neutrons, right, Rather than shedding a positron, remember earlier I told you a neutron we can think of as essentially a proton and an, an electron that have fused together, right? So what I can do is I can add an electron to that krypton atom, right? 
And in doing so, what's going to happen is, or to that krypton nucleus, not the krypton atom, excuse me, right? In doing so, I'm turning a proton into a neutron. So my mass is going to stay 81, okay? But um, I'm going to decrease the number of protons. So my atomic number will no longer be 36. It will be 35. And because my atomic number changed, I would also be a change in what element I am, which would be bromine in this case. Okay? So, how could you tell whether magnesium-23 becomes sodium-23 through electron emission or positron, or electron capture or positron emission? You don't need to know that. All right? It's, it's actually not entirely predictable anyways. It's just uh, experimental evidence to kind of support some basic distinctions. But you guys don't need to know that. You just need to know that either one of these will result in this, right? A decrease in the number of protons, an increase in the number of neutrons, no change in mass, right? And this will come to you guys with practice. I just want to make sure you kind of understand what's happening. So this is positron emission. This is electron capture. Pen got a little glitchy there, all right? So positron emission, electron capture, both of those things accomplish that, all right? Now, uh, last but certainly not least, when we have a really big element, so any atomic number above 83, these are actually all elements above 83 uh, become uh, radioisotopes. They're like, essentially, their nucleus is just too big, okay? Uh, too many protons and too many neutrons actually shed uh, larger pieces. So instead of turning a neutron into a proton or a proton into a neutron with no real change in mass, we're actually going to get rid of some particles and actually reduce that mass by actually a fairly significant amount. Okay? So an alpha particle is essentially a helium nucleus. I mean, that's what we're shedding. We're taking a chunk of that nucleus the size of a helium nucleus and get rid of it. And so our symbol for an alpha particle in our decay equations is this, 4, 2, H, E. So you're essentially writing the symbol for helium, all right? Because that is essentially what you're doing. You're taking enough of that nucleus away to be equal to a helium nucleus, okay? So what happens with our decay with alpha? We're going to decrease our atomic number by 2. We're going to decrease our number of neutrons by 2. So because both protons and neutrons contribute to mass, we're going to see a corresponding decrease of 4 from the mass number. All right? So, again, alpha decay tends to happen with our really big elements. So, like radium-222, for example. All right? So, mass of 222 and atomic number of 88. Okay? So notice that 88 is above 83, which means almost all of our elements are going to undergo alpha decay when they have an atomic number greater than 83. All right? So we're going to see a corresponding decrease of two protons. So my atomic number is going to go down 2, so from 88 to 86. All right? Now, I'm going to see a decrease of 4 from my mass. So 222 is going to become 218. All right? Now, what element has an atomic number 86? You would find that to be radon on your periodic table, right? So radium-222 becomes radon-218. Okay, now, in order to do that, we had to shed an alpha particle. And the symbol for an alpha particle in decay equations is 4 over 2 H. All right, now you might be wondering, wait a minute, radon is also radioactive. So we could expect then another alpha decay from radon to become polonium, another alpha decay of polonium to become something like lead, right? So we might undergo several decays to get down to a stable form. And it's important to remember with our big elements, there's a decay chain that occurs. Sometimes an alpha followed by a beta followed by another alpha followed by a positron, and it eventually becomes stable. And then you'll see some examples of that on your ChemQuest if you haven't already. Okay, um, so what I want you guys to do, of course, is uh, you know you can pause and rewind, and try to figure this stuff out with this video. Uh, but see your textbook, uh, pages two. Uh, sorry, that's not the right pages. Um, 
those pages are posted to Edmodo. I think it's 842 through 846. Sorry about that. Anyways, those actual pages are posted to Edmodo anyways. It doesn't matter which page numbers they are. All right. Uh, take a look through there. I'm sure something will pop out in the text that maybe I didn't explain the best. Uh, take some time to read through that. Do your best to complete ChemQuest 84. That key is posted for you guys. Okay. Um, what I'm also going to do for you, though, is I'm going to go over number four and number five from the last page of the ChemQuest. All right. And uh, that'll be your tutorial video. And what that'll do is I'll kind of go through the same explanation I did here and before to talk about what we should see happening with our different types of decay. Okay. Uh, and so if this video itself wasn't enough, there'll be a tutorial video posted. Uh, then we will uh, work some more on this on Monday. When we come back, I'll have some additional practice on top of that chem quest. And then um, we'll, we'll try a quiz and see how we do and see if maybe some more instructions needed after that. All right. Peace.